Okay, I think we are live streaming now, so let's go ahead and start the lecture. Today, lecture 4A first and 4B later. In 4A, we are going to talk about how to program a real-world processing in memory system. Uh, remember that we already uh, started to talk about this yesterday after having seen a um, comprehensive introduction to processing near memory, different processing near memory approaches. Uh, let me know if you have uh, any questions about the uh, contents we covered yesterday. If you don't have anything to ask right now, uh, let me go ahead and um, and I will basically go over the uh, initial set of slides that we um, started yesterday about programming a real world PIM architecture. And then we will go uh, into more details about you know different steps that you need to follow when you are making use of the admin PIN system. The presentation is very long, but we are not going to cover it entirely. We will uh, cover this lecture for a until the break. Uh, for sure, we will cover everything related to how to program the system. The rest of the lecture you can uh, check by yourself and you can uh, watch previous lectures that cover the, the, the entire content about this uh, admin team architecture. Okay, so let's go. Um, yeah, remember we have been motivating the need for processing in memory as a way of making uh, systems higher performance and more energy efficient. Um, and um, yeah, we have seen, discussed different uh, trends affecting main memory, and we started to talk about processing in memory and what are the two main directions or two main approaches, processing using memory and processing near memory. Remember that this is a highly recommended reading as a, a book chapter, an introduction uh, to processing in memory. Uh, there we uh, cover different team approaches, processing using memory, processing in memory approaches, and we also have a final uh, section about enabling the adoption of processing in memory. This is something that is definitely necessary. Um, I mean, different um, um, challenges, different topics that need to be addressed uh, in order to make um, processing in memory systems in the real world. Uh, and one of the things that we point to here is uh, having access to real hardware systems and prototypes, because this way we can explore, we can evaluate what uh, real systems can do for certain workloads, right? And what could be ways of improving those systems for the future, for future architectures. And um, in recent years, there have been some uh, beam architectures that have appeared. We have already talked about the admin beam architecture, which is uh, the main uh, topic for today's lecture. Uh, remember that uh, the current system that we have access to is a dual socket CPU containing DRAM DIMMs and also PIM enabled DIMMs. Uh, but this is not the only real world PIM system. There, is, there are also a couple of proposals from Samsung. The first one called Thin DRAM or HVM PIM because it's based on HVM2 memory. Remember that the key idea here is to modify uh, some of the DRAM layers in order to integrate um, SIMD units, a small uh, SIMD units uh, in between two, two banks in order to accelerate machine learning and artificial intelligence workloads. Um, a different proposal that is based on uh, as a DIM based solution uh, with um, um, FPGA, reconfigurable fabric on top of the DIM, can be used to accelerate you know, uh, different workloads as well. Um, Samsung, for example, showed how to accelerate the uh, sparse length operators in recommendation systems. And there have been also announcement from other vendors. This is the announcement from SK Hynix, their accelerator in memory architecture, also targeted at machine learning and artificial intelligence, and kind of similar to the uh, HPMP architecture because it also places processing units near the memory banks, and these processing units are SIMD and specialized for um, multiply and accumulate operations. And the last one that we mentioned yesterday was um, this um, um, proposal from uh, Alibaba for acceleration of uh, recommendation systems using hybrid bondings to, uh, to glue together two, two dice, one of DRAM and the other one logic with some um, um, special function units or accelerators for the specific um, parts of the recommendation system. <clears throat> but in more detail, we are talking about the admin beam architecture. Uh, remember that, that we have a lot of resources, papers, uh, also code available uh, to you. Um, these are how the um, current uh, DIMMs look like. These are DDR4 DIMMs, and we were discussing 
what are you know, potential gains that we can have uh, with this kind of system, at least uh, theoretically or and optimistic estimations, and, uh, and what are issues that prevented uh, PIN systems to become a reality earlier. Um, remember that I mentioned this pattern that has like the first very initial description of what say AppMem PIN system is uh, basically a hot CPU that is connected to um, the DRAM DIMMs and in the DRAM DIMMs we have multiple chips and in each of the chips we have uh, um, several uh, processors, right? In particular, in the current generation, there are eight processors. This is more or less how the system looks like. We have the host processor, and then we have the uh, the, 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 the PIM uh, enabled memory with uh, several chips, each of them containing memory arrays and processors. And this is another view, and this is a little bit more detailed. I guess, uh, well, it's good that we repeat this um, as I overview of the existing or current app and pin system with main memory, pin enabled memory, and inside each of the pin chips, we have eight slices, each of them uh, with a DRAM bank of size 64 megabytes. Uh, observe that we call this DRAM bank MRAM or main RAM. And then we have the uh, processor itself. The processor is composed by a pipeline for the execution of instructions from different threads there is an instruction memory that is called IRAM, and there is a um, uh, software managed cache or a scratch pad memory that is called WRAM and is to keep operators uh, that are going to be used by the pipeline. It's not, does, it doesn't work as a regular hardware control cache that automatically brings cache lines from the main memory to the, uh, to the cache. Here is the programmer who has full control on what is placed and where is placed here in the WRAM. And that's something important for you to understand because you'll have to do it yourselves. Okay, this is the um, admin pin system. Well, that's a, a few more details about the number of uh, DIMMs or the number of uh, memory controllers, etc. This is not really so relevant for the <clears throat> Uh, programming lab that you're going to do. <clears throat> the, this current PIN system uh, can have up to 2,560 DPUs and up to 160 gigabytes of PIM enabled memory. And this is the picture that you have seen already several times. Okay, we started talking about how to program this system, right? And uh, we started with a very simple example that is uh, vector addition. Vector addition is easy because it's uh, easy to parallelize. We just need to partition the input and the output array over the different processing elements that we have in the system or PIM cores or DPUs called DPUs in the context of the admin PIM system. We can, we in principle will divide the input into equally sized chunks that are assigned to the different DPUs. And then inside each of the DPUs, we are going to have several threads running and these threads will also get their part of the chunk that was assigned to each TPU, okay? In total, as we will see, we will discuss later, <clears throat> we can have up to 24 tasklets or software threads per DPU. Uh, it's not necessary to reach that number 24 uh, for uh, peak performance, as we will see. Okay, uh, this is a good reference for you, the programming guide. Um, it has all the details. It also has descriptions about the you know, low level instructions, the ISA, which is for sure very interesting for you to look at. And this is the slide where we stopped yesterday is um, with some general programming recommendations uh, for this system. Uh, we will give you more, uh, I mean, there are more programming recommendations later in the presentation, but these are you know, uh, important ones to understand as soon as possible, uh, essentially because they are not only, or uh, at least uh, some of them are not only exclusive to the uh, this admin pin system, but also uh, other pin systems and other parallel systems. Um, so the first one is to execute on the DPUs portions of parallel code that are as long as possible. Remember that this relates to the fact that the admin pin system should be seen as a coarse grain accelerator. We launch an entire function called kernel <clears throat> onto the um, DPUs and, um, and we want them to keep running for a while because this way we are going to amortize as well the cost of moving data 
from the main memory to the pin-enabled memory, right? So that's uh, one key reason. Another key reason is simply the fact that you have many processors in the system, many pin cores in the system with high bandwidth access to the memory, and it's likely that you can accelerate many workloads with uh, such a powerful platform, okay? Uh, also important, uh, in particular in this uh, AppMem pin system, we can see it as a sort of distributed system uh, where each of the pin cores or DPUs has fast access to its own DRAM, its own MRAM, but the access to other parts of the memory is much more complex and, and much more costly. And it's like that. Uh, or one main reason for that is that there is no direct communication channel, as we will discuss later, um, and all communication needs to happen through the host processor. So if we assign to each DPU independent data blocks, then they won't have to access others' data and performance will be faster, okay? And then <clears throat> uh, it's a parallel system. So in principle, the more parallel processors that we use, the more speed up that we can get in our application. But it also depends, right? If uh, the total size of the data set is very, very small, it probably doesn't make sense to use more than, I mean, all the more than 2000 uh, processors because otherwise the amount of computation for each of them will be too small. But yeah, as a general uh, recommendation, use as many working DPUs as possible. And um, finally, this number, 11 tasklets or software threads, this number is coming from uh, prior presentations from AppMem and from the programming guide. Uh, we will see later why this number, but is related to the uh, number of pipeline stages. It's related to the number of pipeline stages because the pipeline is a multi-thread pipeline, a fine-grained multi-thread pipeline that executes instructions from uh, different threads in every cycle. So depending on what's the length of the pipeline, you want to have more or less threads running to occupy the entire pipeline. But anyway, let's, uh, we will recap on that later. Okay, so what's the very first thing that we have to do or, uh, when we are uh, programming we're writing our code for a host processor that has access to AppMem DIMMs that can work as an accelerator where we can offload um, chunk of computation and, and we can keep them um, working for a while. The very first thing that we have to do is to allocate the DPUs or allocate the uh, PIM cores that we want to use. And we create what is called a DPU set. The syntax for that is uh, something like this. Observe that we have this uh, DPU alloc, and in the DPU alloc um, uh, API, we have uh, I mean, three parameters. The first one is the number of DPUs that we want to allocate, and the last one will be the identifier of the DPU set. With the later instruction that you see uh, in line uh, seven, we can get the number of DPUs that has actually been allocated if we want to double check, let's say, and we can print that number, okay? Uh, observe that it's not necessary to allocate all DPUs that there are in the system, which is something that is good as well um, in the sense that we have many DPUs, we have up to 160 gigabytes of memory, we may not need so much memory for one application, so it might make sense to not allocate all DPUs and keep some of the DPUs ready or available for other applications or other processes to allocate them, okay? So in that sense, um, it's... Um, one advantage or one good thing of using DPU alloc. Okay, um, a question here is, can we allocate different DPU sets over the course of a program? Yes, of course we can, uh, because the you know, parallelism, the available parallelism in your workload might change over time, right? There are many uh, algorithms that uh, are, for example, iterative, and in different iterations, they need to process more or less a dynamically changing amount of data, right? And in those cases, well, probably doesn't make sense to um, use uh, or to keep uh, 2,000 DPUs allocated if you just have work for 1,000 DPUs in the next iteration of the algorithm, right? So that's why it's possible to, in the middle of the program, program to deallocate the DPU set using DPU free. And here you can see one example. This is from uh, one. Uh, well, this is. Uh, from our prior work, uh, the, the, the analysis we did for different workloads. Uh, this is a Niedelman Bunch algorithm, is a, um, a genome analysis, a genome alignment or sequence alignment algorithm. Um, we will probably discuss it in a later lecture about bioinformatics. In the Niedelman Bunch, we have to create a two dimensional 
to the matrix, right? And the way that we create it or we process is a dynamic programming algorithm. So um, we uh, create a wavefront pattern over the anti-diagonals and the size, the length of these anti-diagonals changes in the uh, 2D matrix, right? Uh, so uh, the amount of computation in each anti-diagonal is different. And because it's different, we change the number of DPUs that we allocate in each iteration. Observe that in the beginning of one iteration, we free the DPU, we allocate, uh, we free the previously allocated DPUs, we allocate new DPUs depending on how much work we have and how what's the length of the anti-diagonal of the um, scoring matrix in, in NW. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let's continue with the next step. Um, this is the load DPU binary. Uh, remember that the DPUs have uh, two SRAM memories. One of them is they call IRAM, it's an instruction memory. It's not an instruction cache, by the way. Um, so um, it's, um, it's, it's the place where we send the program that we want to execute in each DPU or in each DPU set because uh, observe that when we load the binary, which is a compile code, the, uh, the kernel, the compile kernel that will be run uh, on each DPU, we load for uh, each uh, data set, for the entire data set. Okay, so that's uh, there in line three, you see where the DPU code is located after, uh, after being compiled, and this binary is sent to the uh, to each of the DPUs in the DPU set that will keep it in the IRAM, okay? Observe that there is a maximum size of the program, right? There is a limitation to the length of a program. The limitation are the 24 kilobytes that are the size of the IRAM. Well, but that's my that's probably enough for many workloads, but because it uh, it's about uh, 4,096 instru instructions. Okay. Is it possible to launch different kernels onto different DPUs? Yes, it's possible. You will need to have different DPU sets, right? At the same time, you can use two or more DPU sets uh, in the entire system, even inside the same program. The same program could allocate two D DPU sets at a time, and you could launch different kernels onto the different DPU sets. This way we can exploit task level parallelism. So. Uh, this architecture is good for data level parallelism, but it, it can also be good for task level parallelism, different DPU sets working on different parts of the application. Okay, so what's next? <clears throat> Transferring data between <clears throat> the main memory and the beam enabled memory. Remember that we have a host processor that has access to the main memory and the beam enabled memory. And where everything starts is in the main memory where we have the OS and we have uh, all the initial data of an application, right? Uh, so if we want to use the beam enabled memory for computation, the first thing that we need to do is to transfer uh, from the CPU to the DPU. And when we finish the computation on the DPUs, we will transfer from the DPUs to the CPU or to from the beam enabled memory to the uh, main memory, okay? So this probably raises the question, oh, why can we call processing in memory something that is not really in the main memory, right? That's a, a, a very um, um, a common question here and, and, and very reasonable as well. Well, uh, it, that's uh, related to how the PIM enabled memory is integrated onto the uh, PIM, on the, onto the entire system, right? And uh, there are some reasons for the vendor to keep the main memory separate. Important thing is that uh, you will only need to pay for the transfers in the beginning. So what makes sense in most workloads, if we really want to amortize the cost of moving data from the main memory to the p enabled memory, what makes sense is to keep that data for a long time here and operate multiple times. For example, it's something uh, that makes a lot of sense for um, machine learning training. Machine learning training, we are using large data sets and we need to go again and again over uh, these data sets while we are training the method, right? Uh, so, uh, well, you have to pay for the cost of moving the entire training data set to the PIM enabled memory once, and after that, you can reuse it many, many times, okay? And this way you amortize that cost. 
in the end, all data sets are coming from somewhere else, right? They might come from the SSD, they might come from the network. So there is always an overhead, a cost of moving the data for the first time, right? The point is, is that if you bring something from an SSD to the main memory, for example, you also want to keep it in the main memory for long to amortize, right? Anyway, um, there are uh, different ways of doing these transfers. Uh, the first way, simplest one is uh, serial CPU, DPU, or DPU, CPU transfers. In this case, uh, you are moving data from the main memory to just one DPU in the entire ping uh, enabled memory, or the, the memory transfers can be done in parallel. In this way, we can target many or multiple uh, M rank MRAM banks or uh, DPUs and um, yeah, and uh, basically achieve higher sustained throughput over the memory channels. Mm -hmm. um, only limitation for these transfers is that they need to be all of the same size. Uh, and that uh, might, I mean, in some cases we may need to pad uh, different buffers in order to have them all of the, uh, uh, of the same size. Um, yeah, there is a, a new API that we don't have in the slides and actually is also not part of the, of the uh, lab, but it would be uh, good that you take a look at the programming guide if, uh, if you are interested. Uh, it's, it's called a scatter gather and um, it kind of does parallel transfers where the different buffers transfer to or from different DPUs are of different size. In some sense, it's doing that padding that I mentioned automatically. And the last of the uh, data uh, the, of the uh, transfers is uh, CPU to DPU broadcast transfers. In this case, we target multiple DPUs and we uh, send a single buffer from the main memory to the PIM enabled memory. Okay, that's why it's only in one direction. Yes. Is there a reason why you want to just start up? Just store the that's, that's the thing, right? The, the execution of the program and where the operating system is running is in the main memory. So when you allocate uh, any anything at, at first, uh, because you want to bring it from the SSD or from anywhere else, uh, or just regenerate random data, you first need to uh, place the data in the main memory. So um, yeah. Um, there are different, there are several challenges. We are not going, well, maybe some, something is uh, in a later slide. Uh, there are uh, several challenges why it's not that easy to make this the main memory, let's say. Um, um, but, but yeah, it's not fundamentally impossible. So it would be, uh, there could be ways of making this pin enabled memory the main memory. Uh, as I said, these are uh, also decisions from the vendor. They might have decided to do it this way. Uh, one, reason, one reason might be, for example, that the uh, technology that we, they are using currently for the admin deems is not so advanced as what you can find uh, for DRAM deems, conventional DRAM deems from the main, main vendors, right? And that also uh, would limit the total amount of memory that you would have or that you have per deem. Uh, that might be one reason. There might be another reason might be that, well, uh, maybe it doesn't make sense to have beam enabled memory, which is um, in the end more expensive because it has something else. It has processors inside uh, for the entire system, right? Because uh, you probably won't use the beam capabilities for all applications running on the system or on all the data that you allocate in the in the main in the main memory system but um, but yeah um, as i said there shouldn't there shouldn't be any uh, fundamental reasons why um, you need to have two memories but hybrid memory systems have advantages right as we are discussing in this course as well so yeah you can see this as a hybrid memory system as well okay <clears throat> So let's see how we have to um, um, we have to code these transfers. Uh, by the way, observe that we are going step by step. We first allocate the DPU set, then we load the binary onto the DPUs. We need to uh, do these transfers, of course, because uh, we need to place the initial data set, the input data into the uh, PIM enabled memory. And at some point, we will have to launch the kernel onto the DPUs. We'll have to start the execution onto the DPUs, right? Okay, so let's first take a look at how to do the uh, serial transfers 
um, there are, well, serial transfers can be into, in both directions. So they are called DPU copy to or DPU copy from. And, uh, and what we do is that we transfer part of a buffer for to from each DPU in the DPU set. Uh, where do we, uh, uh, so, um, okay, so th th there is uh, clearly one buffer. Uh, in this uh, example, notice that there are two DPU copy operations. This corresponds to the vector addition example that we, um, that we are um, studying for a start. Um, for, and, and, and that's the reason why we have two transfers in the beginning, right? To each DPU in the DPU set, we are sending two buffers. One corresponds to uh, vector A, the other one corresponds to vector B. These are the pointers to the main memory, okay? These are the size of the transfers. Both chunks of A and B are of the same size, which is what makes sense in vector addition, right? And then observe that uh, well, this is the, let's say the source, right? And the size of the buffer, but now we need to know what's the destination. Uh, on the DPUs, we don't allocate anything explicitly. We don't need to use malloc for the DPUs, but we allocate based on the transfers, based on where we decide or indicate that we want to place the buffers inside the MRAM. And, uh, where the MRAM, MRAM starts is in this address, MRAM uh, or DPU MRAM hit pointer. Okay, this is where it, it starts. So notice that we need to use this offset as well. We place buffer A uh, into the MRAM starting from this address, offset is zero, and we place buffer B right after buffer A. That's the reason why the offset within MRAM corresponds to the size of buffer A, okay? Prefetching mechanism? No, there is not, but you could, uh, you could do uh, software prefetching if you want using these transfers. Yeah, that would make sense in, uh, that might make sense in some applications. Um, and, um, and one, one thing as well is that there are, um, there are ways of doing um, asynchronous uh, execution in the, in the system. And doing asynchronous execution, you have, let's say, certain chances of uh, uh, overlapping these data transfers with the execution on other DPU sets and in some way alleviate uh, the, the cost of moving the data in the beginning and in the end of the program, yes. Uh, supposedly, I mean, in the current uh, admin system, if you are copying, I mean, the CPU is copying something onto, let's say, one DPU or one DPU set, the DPUs in that DPU set cannot run, okay? So at the moment, the access to the MRAM bank is either the CPU or the DPU. In future uh, generations, supposedly, that's what I've heard in uh, some recent talks from admin folks. In future uh, generations, there would be this possibility of, uh, of uh, truly um, uh, overlapping communication and computation because both the CPU could be writing something onto the MRAM while the DPU is using other data also in the MRAM, okay? And that's something can be done in, in GPUs, for example, these days, okay? So Hopefully in the future we will see pin systems doing that as well. And that would definitely alleviate this, um, um, let's say drawback that uh, may represent the fact that the pin enabled memory is not the main memory. Okay, uh, yeah, this is the pointer to the main memory and this is the transfer size. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, yeah, feel free to raise your hand and I will be glad to clarify anything. Uh, parallel transfers, we push different buffers to from a DPU set in one transfer. All buffers need to be the same size. First thing that we have to do is to prepare the transfer and then push it. And here we don't have two different APIs as in the uh, serial transfer where we have copy to and copy from, right? Here we have two APIs, but for different purposes. And then we define the direction of the transfer with uh, one of the um, input uh, uh, parameters, right, uh, for, for, for the push API. Uh, this is transferred to the DPU or it could be transferred from the DPU. Um, 
First thing is for each DPU prepare the transfer. Notice that here we have the pointer to the main memory and the direction and the uh, offset within NRAM. Okay, so starting always from NRAM hit pointer, uh, we uh, uh, indicate what's the offset and uh, the uh, um, CPU will send the buffers of that particular size to all the DPUs in the DPU set at the same time. Okay, so great. And finally, uh, broadcast transfers. Broadcast transfers are, as, as I said, are only from CPU to the DPUs. Uh, the size of the buffer is uh, should be the same for uh, all DPUs in the DPU set. And the syntax is pretty simple as well. That's a, a pointer to the main memory and that's the transfer size. Okay. Well, are we going to uh, need uh, will, will we need uh, different types of transfers in a program? Yes, makes sense, right? That we'll have different types of transfers in a program. For example, if there is some array of data, some buffer maybe of uh, constants or something like that, that all DPUs need to use, you would definitely use a broadcast transfer, right? Because that's the uh, way, best way, most efficient way of transferring the same data to multiple DPUs. Or in some workloads, we may need parallel or shared transfers. Here you have a very simple example here um, in the like a select operation. It's like a filtering operation, right? In this particular example, we are removing um, uh, elements that are uh, even, even values, right? So uh, what do we do? Uh, we can partition the input array into uh, equal size chunks and then use parallel transfers because all buffers will be of the, of the same size, but then the size of the output is going to depend on the actual value. So we will have uh, transfers from different sizes. Here, in principle, we would need to use serial transfers. The overall uh, time of these transfers would take longer, right? Because we have to go one by one over all the DPUs. As I said, there is a more advanced API in the a most recent version of the SDK that allows us to do um, these uh, scatter or gather operations that are kind of parallel and somehow handle internally the padding that is needed to have all um, uh, chunks, all uh, buffers of the same size. Okay. Great. Uh, why are why, why is important to understand these transfers? Uh, not only because we need to use them to send the data to the DPUs and then get the results back, but also because we have to use them for inter-DPU communication. Uh, this is um, a natural limitation of the system is that even inside the same chip, if you have multiple DPUs there, each DPU has only access and exclusive access to its own DRAM bank, but cannot not access other DRAM banks in the system or even in the same chip, right? So all communication between different DPUs needs to happen through the main memory. So we would need to copy data from here to there and then from there move it back to whatever DPUs that we want to communicate, right? Well, the, the, you can think about different uh, example communication patterns. I'm just uh, mentioning here a couple of them. In some cases, you may not, you might just need to merge partial results to obtain the final result. For example, if you are, I don't know, computing a matrix vector uh, multiplication and assign part of the matrix and part of the vector to different DPUs. And at the end, you might need to perform a final reduction to obtain the final values of the, of the uh, output vector, the, the, the output result. In that case, you would only need transfers from the DPUs to the CPU, or maybe you need to redistribute intermediate results, for example, in iterative algorithms like graph processing, uh, in that case, you need more transfers, right? So you need um, communication in both directions. Okay, uh, well, we, we, we ran some measurements in the, one of the systems that we have had access to, um, to, to measure what's the bandwidth of these uh, data transfers is something that we want to understand because um, it might also, I mean, it, it, it's very relevant as well um, 
with respect to what's the potential uh, improvement or potential performance acceleration that we can get, right? We have to uh, definitely take into account these data transfers. Um, we run experiments on a single rank. One rank is uh, 64 DPUs. And we observe that if we go beyond one rank, then the system can exploit channel level parallelism because the dual socket CPU where we run these experiments has several channels. And, uh, but yeah, uh, here you can see some results. These are not really uh, so relevant. The results, the numbers themselves, I think that maybe the key observations are more interesting. <clears throat> One first observation is that when we, well, for larger transfers, uh, we obtain higher uh, sustained bandwidth. And these are experiments on a single DPU where we uh, transfer uh, different sizes in both directions, right? Buffers of different sizes in both directions from eight bytes to 32 megabytes. And we see that larger transfers also provide higher sustained bandwidth. And at some point the bandwidth uh, saturates. That's for one single DPU. We also run experiments uh, for one rank. Observe that if we use serial transfers in one rank, because we go one by one uh, transfer into the DPUs, the um, um, sustained bandwidth is flat. It doesn't increase with the number of DPUs because we are targeting them serially. But if we use parallel transfers, we see that the uh, overall uh, bandwidth increases. So that's one observation. But another observation as well is that this bandwidth scaling is not linear to the number of DPUs. There is, a, I mean, it's not, uh, as we increase the number of DPUs, we don't increase the uh, we don't multiply the, the effective bandwidth by the number of DPUs, unfortunately. The reason for that is that the memory channel itself, uh, where the, uh, the, 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 the PIM DIM is uh, connected, has a, a limited bandwidth as well. In DDR4, uh, the nominal bandwidth um, in one, for one rank is 90 gigabytes per second. Um, we can see that the maximum bandwidth for uh, parallel transfers is uh, far from uh, those 19 gigabytes per second, but not that far if we use serial transfers because they make better, uh, sorry, not serial, broadcast transfers is a, the red line. And uh, well, it's um, one reason is that uh, there is a better exploitation of the locality in the CPU cache hierarchy. That's uh, one um, guess about the, what's the, this different in performance. But yeah, uh, overall, the main conclusion here is that Bandwidth is certainly limited uh, between the uh, main memory and the beam enabled memory, but this limitation is coming from the actual bandwidth of the memory channel and the uh, DDR4 uh, rank in this case. Okay. There is one more uh, important thing that might affect and limit the actual bandwidth between main memory and the beam enabled memory is the need for transposing the, the, the data. Um, in a way that each DPU gets the data that the programmer decides. Um, um, uh, yeah, and, and this is done in software by the runtime library. Uh, why is that needed? Because if you think, uh, we, we haven't covered much, much about the DRAM yet, but for sure you will uh, review the fundamentals, the basics of uh, how DRAM works and, and how it's uh, hierarchically organized um in, in later lectures uh, but one thing that you probably already know if not uh, I, I will i will uh, I'm, I'm telling you uh, is that in the rank we have in these uh, particular dims we have eight chips right if you use them as normal dram um the the way that you map uh, bits onto those eight chips is normally mapping eight consecutive bits onto each consecutive chip, right? And in total, if you have eight chips, there are 64 bits that you would be reading at a time, okay? 64 bits. But now think that uh, in each chip, we have eight banks and eight DPUs. And we want each DPU to access relatively large chunks of data, or at least access one entire value, right? And this value can be 32 bits or can be 64 bits, right? But if you think about array A and array B and their elements, imagine that those arrays A and B are um, in 64, 
okay, 64-bit integers. If that's the case, in a normal regular uh, mapping, we would have the first eight bit here, the next eight bit here, the next eight bit here, and the first element, first 64 bits, good span the eight chips, right? But we don't want that. We want the each DPU to access entire values, right? Because we want to perform computation, uh, um, useful and, 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 and correct uh, computation with those DPUs. So uh, what the um, um, rental library does is that it kind of transposes, right? Remaps the data in software so that we assign to each of the banks here and to each of the DPUs in each of the chips, the number of the, um, I mean, the amount of data that the programmer wants to assign, okay? So that can be uh, rearranged in software and then perform the actual transfer. Okay, uh, yeah, well, uh, there is a code available for the experiments, uh, the experimental results that I showed earlier, if you want to take a look. And remember, after performing the transfers, we need to start the execution on the DPUs. That's the kernel launch operation. And that's uh, very simple. It's uh, just this DPU launch uh, and uh, one of the parameters can be synchronous or asynchronous, depending on whether we want to have synchronous execution or asynchronous execution. If it's synchronous, that means that the CPU is going to stop here until the kernel terminates, and then the CPU will continue, okay? Uh, if it's asynchronous, the CPU can continue doing stuff here while the, uh, yeah, while the um, DPUs are still working. And this can be useful, uh, again, for task level parallelism, because we can uh, do one, so a DPU launch on one DPU set and next DPU launch on another DPU set, right? And they could be doing different things, why not? So that allows us to explore, to exploit task level parallelism or the concurrent computation of CPU and DPUs. The CPU can be doing productive work after launching the kernel uh, onto the DP and maybe accelerate different parts of the same workload. Okay, um, yeah, what else? Oh, when we call the kernel or before we call the kernel, we also uh, need to uh, send some uh, input parameters, some arguments, right? Uh, these arguments are going to be copied directly onto WRAM, uh, not in MRAM, okay? because usually they are maybe integers or a pointer or something like that. I mean, it's a relatively uh, short amount of data. Uh, we, uh, in, in, in our examples co in example codes, and actually that's a template that you're going to use in the lab, uh, there are some uh, structs that we created to keep uh, those parameters. And, uh, and yeah, in the end, we end up sending them to uh, so with either with serial transfers or with parallel transfers in the same way as we do with MRAM. Okay, so the syntax of this is exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the destination. This destination has been declared in WRAM using this uh, host uh, qualifier, which means that can be accessed by the host. But this is the actual address in WRAM where we are transferring the, this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, now you know how to allocate DPUs, how to send the code that will run on those DPUs, how to launch the kernel, how to perform the data transfers between the main memory and the uh, p enabled memory. Uh, now what we need to learn is how to program the kernel itself, right? For vector addition, that is uh, fairly simple because the operations that we do are fairly simple. We read one element from one input array, another element from another input array. We add them and we store them in the destination array, okay? In this um, code, the destination array is the same as one of the input arrays, is a array B. Uh, and uh, you might see that, you know, looks like a little bit complex uh, or there are many lines there that probably, well, you don't know yet why, why, why they are there. The actual vector addition is happening here. And <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's actually in the lesson, uh, next slide, but what, let's go first over each of the lines here and you'll see that they are not so difficult to understand. First of all, we have the uh, tasklet ID. Remember that 
It's a fine grained multi threaded processor. There are up to 24 threads that are called tasklets running. And uh, these, uh, the way of programming this system is called SPMD, single program multiple data. We write a single, um, um, a single code that all threads or tasklets are going to run. But each of the tasklets will operate on different data instances, right? And in order to distribute the total data over these uh, different tasklets, those different uh, instances of the data, we need a way of addressing the data that each tasklet will use. And that's why each tasklet has a threat identifier or a tasklet ID, okay? Uh, next uh, is the size of the vector tile processed by a DPU. Okay, so that's one of the input arguments. Then these are the addresses in MRAM where arrays A and B are going to be located for the DPU threads to access. Okay, remember the DPU MRAM heap pointer that we already used for the transfers. Remember as well that we first placed in MRAM from, from the CPU with the, with the data transfers. Uh, we first placed the um, um, buffer A and then buffer B. And that's why the address of array B in the MRAM starts after this input size DPU bytes transfer, which is the, um, the data that we are transferring for chunk A, okay? For, for buffer A, okay? Now, that's the MRAM. If we want the WRAM to access the data in the MRAM, first thing that we need to do is bring in the data from the MRAM to the scratchpad memory, which is closer to the pipeline. And there is where we put the operands for the pipeline to use them. So remember that we don't allocate anything explicitly in MRAM, but we do it in WRAM. That's why we need to use this memalloc and we are allocating two buffers called cache A and cache B. They are called cache, but remember that this is not a hardware cache, it's a scratch pad or a software cache. Uh, so cache A has a size block size, for example, 1024 bytes, and cache B has the same size. And then we'll have to go over the entire array in MRAM and bring chunks of that array or those arrays in MRAM to the caches, to the WRAM for the actual computation by the ALUs in the pipeline. Okay, that's why we have a for loop here because the entire uh, array or entire buffers of A and B in MRAM might be, I don't know, uh, one megabyte or more. Uh, remember that the maximum size, I mean, the size of the MRAM is 64 megabytes. So you have many megabytes there and then go chunk by chunk reading uh, from A, reading from B and bringing the data to the WRAM. Here, cache A and cache B. And each tasklet is bringing a different chunk of the uh, buffers A and B in MRAM. And that number, I mean, and, and, and those uh, chunks are identified by an index, base tasklet that is, uh, is coming from here, right? No, no, where, where is base tasklet? Uh, okay, it's right there. Okay, base, base tasklet, that uh, is a function of the thread ID or the tasklet ID, okay? So thread zero, read this, thread one, read this, thread two, read this, and so on and so forth. They bring the entire thing to the WRAM and now it's ready for the actual vector addition operation, okay? You see many lines of code here. These operations in the end are very, very fast because uh, they are bringing a large chunk from memory. They are exploding full bandwidth. Remember that uh, the processor, the, the DPU is very close to the uh, DRAM bank, okay? That's a vector addition in the next slide. And finally, we will need to do this MRAM write to write back from the WRAM to the MRAM, okay? With the uh, actual result that we will store where array B was. And this is the vector addition. This is much more simple to understand. That's the computation that each of the tasklets performs on the chunk of size L size from buffer A and from buffer B, okay? The actual addition operation.
Uh, do you guys have any questions about this? Yes. Yes, yes, it's uh, based on LLVM, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, they, they have their own compiler, yes. You'll see in the programming guide, I think probably in this presentation, we also have some, but in the programming guide, you can check the entire ISA. So uh, the, the LLVM compiler uh, compiles to, uh, to that ISA. It's pretty, I think it's pretty um, intuitive and, and easy to understand um, if, you, if you want to take a look. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, so then, yeah, let's uh, continue. A tasklet, okay, now let, we are going to talk about the tasklets a, a little bit more. The, these threads that run on the uh, DPUs. Is a software thread or is a software abstraction of a hardware thread. Each tasklet has its own memory space in WRAM, and that's indeed what we did here, right? This memaloc, of size or these two memalocs of size, block size, are per tasklet. All tasklets are doing this. So if you are running 16 tasklets, this means that there are 16 buffers in WRAM for A and 16 buffers in WRAM for B, because each of them is bringing their own chunk of buffers A and B in MRAM, okay? So each of them can have their own uh, pointer, uh, so their own space in MRAM, but they can also, they can also, um, um, share pointers. Uh, you could um, you could have one space in WRAM for a thread for the different tasklets or the different threads to communicate. Uh, all of them will see that uh, that uh, space in WRAM in a similar way as they see the um, the input arguments as well, the same input arguments as well. And, uh, and yeah, the, so uh, it's uh, the WRAM is for each tasklet individually, but they can also access others WRAM, okay? And uh, one um, uh, other uh, important um, um, characteristic is that the tasklets running on the same DPU can synchronize. It's a parallel processor, right? And uh, we have multiple threads running different parts or different uh, operating on different parts of the data at some point they might need to synchronize in different ways. If you guys are familiar with uh, P threads, uh, you probably know this mutex lock and mutex unlock is like a way of creating a critical section or a mutual, mutual exclusion or a section of the code where only one thread can be at the same time. For example, if you want to update some data structure atomically, that would be the way of, uh, of doing that, right? So when one thread reaches the mutex lock, uh, the access to the critical section is, um, is uh, blocked for the rest of threads. When the thread releases the lock with mutex unlock, the critical section will become available to another thread, okay? Then they will have handshakes. Handshakes are a way of communicating uh, two threads. Uh, uh, one of them would be waiting for the other one to notify something. You can see this as a flag that is uh, updated by one of the threads and the other thread is checking the flag. When the flag is set, the second thread can, the thread that was waiting can continue the execution. And then we also have barriers. In the barriers, uh, we, have, uh, um, uh, we have all threads uh, waiting at the same time or reaching the same synchronization, synchronization point. Uh, and, uh, and so first threads to arrive at the barrier will have to wait for the remaining threads to arrive at the barrier before continuing the execution. And finally, we have the uh, semaphores that uh, similar way can be used to synchronize threads in um, typically producer consumer problems. Okay, you can find uh, examples and um, um, you know, uh, additional information about the synchronization primitives in the programming guide. So next thing, uh, the, Oh yeah, well, another example, different one, parallel reduction. This one requires communication. That's why we were introducing the uh, synchronization primitives earlier. What's a parallel reduction? Parallel reduction is an operation where we have an input array and we want to obtain a final value. For example, you have an input array and you want to add all the elements of that array, right? Uh, that's an operation that can be done in parallel, but if we have a single counter, or we have a single accumulator, we will need to coordinate, right, between the different, uh, between the different threads. 
um, in a um, CPU or in a GPU, we could use atomic operations. We tell uh, all threads uh, that we have to grab one element of the input array and then update atomically the, uh, the accumulator, right? But that's not very efficient. Normally, uh, there are more efficient ways of doing it. One thing that we can do is uh, divide the entire uh, array onto uh, as many DPUs we have in the system and inside each DPU uh, divided for the different tasklets running on the same DPU. For example, here are four tasklets. Each of them gets their own uh, part of the input and they compute a local sum and then they uh, accumulate the local sum in the final uh, result, right? Um, the way that, so we can, um, uh, implement this in different ways. The first part is, uh, is easy, right? Because the first part, part is just about accumulating in the local sum. Notice, observe that we have here a for loop, again, a base tasklet, the index where each tasklet is going to start reading from the input array, bringing chunks of that input array to the uh, uh, WRAM, Right, load cache with current MGRAM block. This cache A that has been uh, allo uh, the, the, uh, allocated uh, sometime earlier before the for loop for sure, and and then and then we have here this um, uh, reduction. The reduction is just going over cache A, reading element by element, and accumulating uh, in the uh, local count. Okay, in the local counter. So. Um, um, yeah, at some point um, when, when this for loop is complete, that means that all different tasklets have their own local count, right? And that's what, what, what is what they are going to do next. Each of them is going to store the local count into one position of this message array that is also in WRAM. And this one is accessible by all tasklets. So each of them writes their local count in the, um, in the WRAM. And finally, we have a barrier, right? All threads reach to this point. When all threads reach to the, this point, that means that all threads have already written their local sum onto the WRAM, and we have the final reduction. Just a single tasklet going over all the elements of this message, right? And accumulating in just one final accumulator that contains the total count or the final reduction result. That is a way of doing it. Observe that here, the final reduction is done by a single uh, thread. It's not really the most efficient way of doing that, right? Uh, it performs pretty well on this architecture, but the main reason for that is that uh, we don't have many tasklets. Typically, we are going to use 12, 16, 24 at most, and adding, accumulating 24 numbers or 16 numbers is pretty fast, right? But you could have many more in other parallel systems, GPUs, for example, you could have many more threads, right? And if you have many more threads and many more local sums, you don't want to do that uh, final accumulation or final reduction sequentially. You could do it in parallel. How? Well, with a pattern that is called the tree-based reduction. In every iteration, half of the threads retire, the remaining threads keep working there, accumulating the partial results until we get the uh, final result. So we could implement the uh, tree-based reduction as well in these uh, admin uh, DPUs, right? Uh, notice that now instead of having the single thread reduction here, we have multiple threads uh, working, uh, multiple tasklets working. Part of the tasklets retire in each iteration because they are not going to fulfill these predicate here, and, uh, but the, the, the threads that continue, the tasklets that continue running will keep accumulating following the tree-based uh, reduction pattern. At the, at the end of each iteration, they need to synchronize before they continue the execution. Yes. Uh, you mean the local count? Yeah, the local count. Uh, is in a, uh, yeah, you, you can assume that, uh, where was it? Uh, this L count is in a register. You can assume that that's in a register, but then when you copy it to message, this message is in WRAM because that's the way for other tasklet 
to see what uh, the rest of tasklets uh, uh, calculated. Uh, well, you, you're the programmer, you have to deal with that. In principle, the uh, WRAM is 64 kilobytes. So there, there is uh, plenty of, well, not plenty, but there is enough space uh, for, for you to allocate these uh, intermediate variables, for example. But yeah, it's, it's, it's something to take into account. Uh, think um, that, you know, these processors, even though, as, as you can see, we are programming them using C language, right? And, and we are programming them the same way as if they were out of order CPUs, uh, but the reality is that the hardware is much more limited. Um, that's why the programmer needs to be uh, skilled enough and understand uh, enough of the architecture to be able to uh, use this uh, hardware properly, right? Uh, the good thing is, um, uh, well, you, you can allocate these, uh, well, the, the, the allocation is not here, but you can use memalloc, allocate relatively large um, uh, buffers in the WRAM for the different tasklets. And then uh, when bringing the data from the MRAM to the WRAM, those large buffers allow you to bring a lot of data at a time and this way maximize the memory bandwidth, which is in the end, the key advantage of this system. Other questions? Okay, so next, uh, yeah, we were here um, and this is the tree base reduction. Yeah? Uh, there are other ways uh, of uh, implementing this tray-based reduction, not only with, uh, with uh, barriers, you can also use handshakes, because in the end, uh, observe that in the, uh, the tree-based reduction, we are, uh, well, we are, um, um, so each, in, in each iteration, one tasklet is reading the partial results from another tasklet that is as a at a certain distance. So in each iteration, it, each tasklet just needs to be communicated or in contact with one other tasklet. And that's why we can communicate these pairs of tasklets using uh, handshakes, which are a little bit more lightweight than the barrier, at least in the implementation in the current admin system. So uh, handshake based, should be uh, at least a slightly faster. Anyway, you are going to experiment with the parallel reduction for sure, because you will be asked to implement these different versions. And uh, you can learn more about parallel reduction in some other lectures. For example, this, was, this one corresponds to the heterogeneous systems course. Um, but yeah, the basic um, um, ideas, the basic concepts uh, in parallel reduction are universal, are independent of the actual uh, parallel system. Okay, find more about the handshakes, barriers, etc. cetera, uh, here in tasklet management and synchronization. Okay, so uh, we have already covered, let's say the basics of uh, admin pin programming. Let me know if you have any questions. If not, you will have questions when uh, uh, you receive the, the lab, um, but yeah. Um, uh, you, can, you can ask more questions in Moodle or to the TAs, et cetera. Uh, now, before we go to the break, uh, because I guess, yeah, we can go to the break in 15 minutes or so, no? Um, uh, so um, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, talk a little bit more about the admin pin system. And I'm going to talk about, you know, I'm going to give you more details about the DRAM processing unit, about the DPUs, for you to understand the system uh, even better. And, um, and, and, and probably that will help you as well understand the results that you get uh, when you run your programs on the, on the DPUs or on the simulator that we will use. Um, yeah, um, this is how the system looks. We can take a closer look to each of the chips. Remember, you have already seen this picture, but uh, an updated one, not the one corresponding, not, not this one that is uh, coming from the, from the patent, but there you have the memory bank, and then you have the instruction memory pipeline, a local memory, you see. And, uh, and this is the uh, picture that you have seen earlier with the DDR4 interface. This one is common to all banks, is for the CPU, to access the uh, DRAM banks, we have the uh, eight uh, 64 megabyte DRAM banks called MRAM, and there is a DMA engine that is used to 
either move instructions from the MRAM to the IRAM or operands between the MRAM and the WRAM using MEMRAM-read and MEMRAM-read and, and, MRAM read and, MRAM read and MRAM read that we have already seen in the, uh, in the code, in the code of the vector addition. And then we have uh, this pipeline. The pipeline has in total 14 stages um, in the most uh, recent uh, generation of the admin deems. I think it's not even uh, 425, it's uh, 450 megahertz, maximum frequency that uh, I have seen. And, and there are uh, these uh, four times. Uh, so this pipeline is fine grain multi threaded. Uh, I have a couple of slides about fine grain multi threading um, uh, in, uh, next. But let me first go over uh, the uh, 14 pipeline stages. Uh, we have uh, stages for thread selection. There are up to 24 threads running here, right? So first thing to decide when we are going to launch one instruction to execute on the pipeline is to decide what's the next thread. And here we can assume a round robin policy where first we launch an instruction for thread zero, in the next cycle we launch an instruction for thread one and so on and so forth. Uh, each of the threads has its own program counter for them to read the corresponding instruction from the program. Notice that the program is exactly the same for all tasklets running here because the IRAM is just a single one where we are allocating, where we are uh, placing the binary, right? Or copying the binary. Then we need to access the register file to read operands, format those operands, and then uh, four cycles for ALU computation or for access to the WRAM and finally some uh, result formatting before writing back to the um, uh, register file, okay? But what is fine-grained multithreading? You are probably already familiar with fine-grained multithreading. It's a hardware technique to hide latencies uh, in the pipeline. We have a multi, we have a pipeline with multiple stages. Uh, you guys have studied uh, pipeline data paths, right? And, and you know what done. When there are dependencies in the pipeline, we have to stall the execution of instructions until the previous executions got resolved, until we have the um, um, output results from previous instructions because of these data dependencies. Uh, or we might need uh, data forwarding units. You might remember that as well from the uh, MIPS pipeline that you probably studied. Uh, as soon as one value is uh, calculated by LU, we can move it back, we can forward it to the corresponding pipeline stage where the dependent instruction is, right? However, uh, that, well, requires uh, additional hardware to select, to, to detect uh, when we have these, um, these uh, hazards, right? We need to have either the um, stall unit or the data forwarding unit that make decisions in the pipeline. But these units require hardware, right? Required area. And probably in a system like uh, the, the uh, AppMem uh, uh, DPUs or PIM cores, where the um, you know building the processor itself is already very challenging because it's not done with CMOS logic but with uh, DRAM uh, technology. Um, it might be better to use a available area for something else for ALUs. So um, you can avoid data dependencies as well if you execute on the pipeline instructions that for sure are independent because they belong to different threads. That's the basic idea. So each of the threads has its own context, its, its, its own, uh, their own registers and their own, um, and their own uh, program counter. So uh, for example, if you have 16 threads, each of the threads checks its program counter and fetches the corresponding instruction from the instruction memory or from the IRAM in the DPU and start the execution of that instruction. Okay, and a few cycles later, or, or in the next cycle, you fetch one instruction for an, from another thread, next cycle, another instruction from another thread, and so on and so forth. And sometime later, let's say 11 cycles later, you can again fetch one instruction from the, for the same thread, for thread zero. But at this point, the uh, previous instruction from that thread is already far in the pipeline, so 
the, the, there is no longer a dependency. So that's the uh, basic idea in fine-grained multithreading, is switching to another thread in order to avoid dependencies in the pipeline. And uh, well, there are uh, some lectures that you can check um, about fine-grained multithreading. For example, this one from Professor Mudlow, if you uh, need to go a little bit deeper, but that's uh, what you need to keep in mind when uh, working with this admin pin system, with uh, this admin DPUs, you have a, a pipeline of uh, 14 stages uh, in every single cycle. We start the execution of a new instruction from a different thread. Now, this number here, this number of pipeline stages relates to the number of uh, threads that we need for peak performance, right? Remember that general programming recommendation use at least 11 tasklets. You remember that, right? The number of pipeline stages is 14. The only thing is that the last stages can be uh, for the same thread done in parallel uh, with the initial stages for the same thread for different instructions. So in reality, the dependence is only uh, of 11 cycles and that's why uh, 11 cycles already uh, achieve the maximum performance in this, um, uh, in this core, as long as there are instructions to execute. Okay, the instructions that you execute are all described in the ISA, in the uh, programming guide, and I encourage you to uh, take a look. I want to show you a little bit, uh, a, a few more things. Um, in our first work, we did a lot of analysis of this PIM architecture to understand what are, what, what's their potential, right? And one thing we measure is the arithmetic throughput of the uh, DPUs. Uh, and we created micro benchmarks for that, for different data types, different operations, et cetera. And using an accurate cycle counter that the SDK provides, we measure the execution time. Uh, this is one of the uh, micro benchmarks is the addition of 32 bit integers. The code that we write is the code above, is a um, C code that we write for the DPU. And this is how the code looks after compilation. As you see, uh, I think uh, pretty uh, easy to understand each of the instruction names, right? Like right, right? this move or a load word or add or store word, etc. So uh, yeah, for example, that's the for loop, right? For the for loop, we need to uh, update the index and we need to jump to the beginning of the, of the loop. And then you have the access to the buffer. That buffer A is in WRAM, remember? So we are reading and placing uh, the data in one register. That what, that's what we do here. First of all, we need to calculate the address, right? Probably these, um, R0 contains uh, the, the, the pointer to buffer A and R2, exactly, R2 is the index. So this way we calculate what's the address to the WRAM and then we read that address and write the value, the, the, the uh, uh, loaded value onto this R4. Then we perform the addition. We are adding one scalar that is here in R1. And finally, we store the result to NRAM, to WRAM. Okay, pretty intuitive, right? And easy to understand. So then we measure the performance, the arithmetic throughput for different number of, of tasklets from one to 24, which is the maximum. And the uh, arithmetic throughput in mega operations per second is in the Y axis for different uh, data types, 32-bit, uh, 64-bit integers, floating point, double precision, and uh, the different instructions, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Well, those are results for addition and subtraction and for multiplication and division. And these are the results for the other data types. There are several observations here, right? Several things that you observe. First of all, the performance, the arithmetic throughput saturates. And it saturates were expected in 11 tasklets. After 11 tasklets, the pipeline is full of the, all the time. And because the pipeline is full of the time, we are retiring one instruction every single cycle. So we are already obtaining the maximum performance. That's in all cases. Next thing that we observe is that um, the 32-bit integer addition is a bit faster than the 64-bit integer addition. And then we can take a closer look <clears throat> at the code and see why this happens. Uh, this is a nice tool that you can use yourself. It's called Compiler Explorer. It is a pointer in the, in the handout that you will get uh, for, the, for the lab. 
Uh, but yeah, what, what you can see in this part is a um, C code uh, for 32 bits and for 64 bits is the same micro benchmark that we have just uh, presented, but for either uh, 32 or 64 bits. But the code is exactly the same as you see. However, the compiled code don't, don't look exactly the same. Uh, the main reason is that the 64 bit code has this additional instruction, add C is add with carry. The carry is coming from this add, and then we are using it to add the 32 bit, 32 um, um, most significant bits of every of the uh, 64 bit values, right? So observe. The, the, this architecture can handle 64 bit values, but the registers and the arithmetic units, the ELUs are 32 bit. Okay, so that's why we need two instructions for a 64 bit addition. And that additional instruction is what makes that, well, you need one more instruction for the 64 bit addition. And that's what makes that difference in the peak throughput, okay? Well, there are uh, other observations uh, that you, we can make here. For example, even for 32-bit integers, there is a large performance difference between addition and subtraction and multiplication and division. And what's the reason for that? The reason for that is that there is no 32-bit multiplier. There is no 32-bit multiplier. The ELUs uh, in the DPU pipeline don't uh, execute 32-bit multiplications. The 32-bit multiplication is implemented in a different way. There could be different ways of implementing them, by the way. But the way that they implement them in the current uh, SDK is by using one instruction that performs bit shifting and addition in one cycle, in a similar way as when you compute a multiplication uh, on, on paper, right? By hand. So that's what makes that the uh, arithmetic throughput for the multiplication and division uh, is significantly lower because there is no native hardware for the 32 bit multiplication. So we need to somehow emulate the execution of this instruction, or we need to use one routine that might take up to 32 cycles to execute, or 32 instructions. And there are also um, significant performance differences between integers and uh, floating point numbers. Uh, you can see that the difference is basically one order of magnitude. Again, the reason is the same. Floating point, number, floating point computations are not natively supported by this hardware. It's an integer. Um, um, what it has is an in, in, integer ALUs. Uh, so, um, so yeah, floating point computations are also emulated. In principle, if your workload needs to use floating point arithmetic, most likely this pin system won't be a good fit for your workload. Good thing is that many workloads also use integers, even workloads that use floating point uh, can um, eventually use fixed precision and still obtain reasonably accurate results. So um, still this beam architecture can be useful for, uh, for different um, applications as well. Um, compared to Samsung HBM PIM or to SK Hynix AIM, remember that those really support floating point. They actually support 16 bit, 16 bit floating point computations. And I, as I was explaining yesterday, the reason is that the type of workloads that they are targeting, right? 16 bit floating point um, is useful in many machine learning models or neural network models these days. And that's why those two vendors focus on that data type is still limited because not all networks work on 16 bits, some of them in 32 bits, some others in eight bits, even with integers in some cases. Um, uh, but yeah, in the end, they, these are design decisions, right? Uh, a floating point unit in hardware is more complex than an integer unit. So if you have a more complex unit, probably you cannot have in the same hardware, the uh, same variety of instructions. In that sense, the admin PIM architecture is, uh, is, um, is limited because it only supports integer computation, but is uh, more, um, um, I mean, it has a wider scope and more general purpose because it supports more uh, operations, not just multiplication and addition as the, as the other PIM architectures. 
Okay, but yeah, it's uh, all about uh, studying the systems and understanding uh, what are their strengths and their weaknesses and what applications they might be useful for. Remember that that's why it's good to have access to real world pin systems um, to also enable the adoption of these pin systems in the future. Okay, this is, I guess, most of what I wanted to show you. Um, and the rest of the slides, uh, it, I mean, it's a very, uh, comprehensive um, uh, trip over the, all the analysis we did from this uh, PIM architecture. We evaluated, for example, the bandwidth of the WRAM using the stream benchmark, uh, also for the MRAM uh, using um, a stream benchmark and also using a strided random benchmarks and, and, and random access patterns and computed what's a sustained bandwidth for all the different memory spaces. I think this is very uh, instructive for you to um, understand, but uh, we will point you to some other lectures uh, that uh, you may uh, want to take a look at. Uh, for sure, you already know, have the basis, uh, the, the basics, or, or uh, have the foundations uh, for the lab, uh, and um, after that, you can you know continue going deeper into your knowledge as much as you want. Okay, I want to show you just, uh, well, we, we are going to uh, make a break right now, but I want to show you just very, very quickly some other analysis we did, for example, for MRAM. Uh, one thing we measured was the latency and the bandwidth of the uh, MRAM write and MRAM read operations, where we move data between MRAM and WRAM. And those are our measurements for different data, data transfer sizes. This is for MRAN read and for MRAN write. What you can see is that the, 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 the darker blue line is the uh, bandwidth. And this bandwidth uh, tends to saturate after, for example, around 5, 12 bytes, right? What does it mean is that you probably want to maximize as much as possible the length of these transfers because this means that you get more bandwidth from the MRAM from the memory, right? So in principle, that's uh, something good to do uh, when you want to accelerate the performance uh, of a particular workload. Um, and one more thing that I want to show you just very, very quickly before we stop is um, some analysis with it of arithmetic throughput versus operational intensity. And that I think it's very um, uh, revealing in the sense that we observe how uh, weak or how wimpy in some sense the uh, PIM cores are. This is uh, sort of the micro benchmark that we used. Um, it's, uh, in the end, it's, it's just performing some operation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division a number of times. For every element that we read from MRAM and from WRAM, we perform these operations many times. The idea is to change the operational or arithmetic intensity. And um, and, uh, and yeah, I want to show you this. Um, so um, the operational intensity is the number of operations per byte that we read from memory. That's why we change the number of repetitions for the operations that we perform on each element. And we do, uh, uh, I mean, we analyze operational intensity values from very, very low to something relatively high. Or notice that this uh, Y axis is the arithmetic throughput. And then in the execution of the micro benchmark, we or the experiments, we use different number of tasklets. And uh, you can see up to 16 tasklets, uh, that's what represents each of the dots. And, uh, and, and we observe that at some point, the performance saturates as well. So uh, there is an arithmetic uh, intensity or an operational intensity at which the um, uh, performance saturates and then remains flat. And this we call the memory bound region and the compute bound region. In the memory bound region, the um, arithmetic throughput increases with the operational intensity in the compute bound region, the arithmetic throughput is flat, okay? The most uh, relevant and interesting observation here is this throughput saturation point, this tran uh, transition between the memory bound region and the compute bound region, and the number of the operational intensity at which it happens, right? We saturate the throughput of this system as soon as we perform one fourth operations per byte, which means one single addition per 32 bit element, if we are talking about integers. So now you think about 
programs that you usually write and when you access some data from an array in the, in the main memory and perform some computations, etc. Think about how many workloads have such a low operational intensity. Okay, and you will see that um, not so many. There are some, that for sure, but not so many. So what this basically represents is that most real workloads will be in this part in the compute bound region, meaning they are no longer memory bound. They are no longer limited by the access to memory, are limited by the available compute resources because you are already hitting the peak performance in some sense, okay? Okay, uh, yeah, let me know if uh, there are any questions uh, and let's uh, continue in 15 minutes.
with the second part of the lecture, lecture 4B, enabling the adoption of processing in memory or how to enable the adoption of processing in memory. Uh, in this lecture, I mean, we will, we will be talking about this uh, until 4 p.m., right, until the end of the lecture, so for one hour or so. Um, we will go pretty quickly over most of the slides. Um, the presentation is quite long. A uh, good thing is that uh, we have already been talking about um, many of the issues, many of the potential barriers that still prevent from the um, um, actual uh, integration of uh, processing and memory capabilities in real systems, right? Uh, remember that uh, we want to turn processor uh, um, memory um, computing systems uh, into something more data centric, more memory centric, not so much processor centric as, as they have been so far. And that means that uh, we want to have processing in memory or near data processing capabilities in, uh, in our systems in order to not move data so much, right? But the uh, changes that we want to uh, do in current computing systems are not trivial. So there are the, 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 that makes that they uh, have uh, or there are barriers uh, to the adoption of processing in memory because there are different issues that we need to deal with in order to uh, facilitate the integration of PIMP capabilities in real systems. And here you see some of those uh, potential barriers for adoption of PIMP systems. We have already talked about the first one, applications and software for PIMP. It's uh, all about identifying what are applications and developing software uh, for PIN systems, identifying what applications can benefit from processing in memory and develop software for those processing in memory systems. The previous lecture was uh, exactly about that. So also kind of uh, about uh, point number two, ease of programming. Uh, as you have seen, programming a real world PIN system like AppMem requires us to learn new things, requires us to learn about the architecture, about how we need to move data from the NRAM to the WRAM, how we um, uh, write our programs using single program, multiple data um, uh, programming model for, uh, with uh, code for uh, different, uh, the different tasklets. So that's also uh, something important. There, there is, of course, a learning curve, but at some point we can overcome it. Uh, it's not that difficult to program such system, and we can even eventually facilitate uh, the work of the programmers by developing compilers or more high-level compilers, or, for example, um, uh, libraries that can um, make programming even easier. But that requires work for sure. Then we have system and security support. Uh, yesterday, we were already talking about um, uh, how to deal with virtual memory address translation or for, with cache coherence in some systems, for example, and, and we will see a, a few slides later. If you have a, CP, a CPU accessing memory and inside memory, we have processing near memory cores or PIM cores, uh, they might be operating on the same data structures. So uh, we always want all processors to access uh, updated uh, values, updated uh, data, right? So uh, we need to um, enable some coherence mechanisms to coordinate basically both sides. Uh, synchronization as well, observe in the admin PIN system that we have more than 2000 cores uh, and we might eventually need to communicate or synchronize these cores in the current admin PIN system. This is not very efficient because all communication and synchronization between different PIM cores needs to happen through the host CPU, but there could be other more advanced ways of doing this synchronization and communication, for example, with um, 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 dedicated networks inside the chips, right? So we are going to uh, talk about synchronization as well. Or uh, runtime and, compil and compilation systems for adaptive scheduling, data mapping. How do we need to map the data? For example, one graph is, a irregular, is an irregular data structure. Uh, so it's not that easy to partition, right? But if we have multiple cores in the system, we have to partition it in some way. What's the most um, um, optimal or near optimal partitioning of the graph onto the different PIM cores. Uh, that was uh, something we discussed briefly yesterday uh, with respect to the Tesseract uh, accelerator, right? And or the scheduling, there might be workloads for which 
uh, or parts of the workloads that are more suitable for PIM or less suitable for PIM, or maybe depending on what's the data set, they are more or less suitable, right? The same operation, um, uh, matrix vector multiplication, if you are operating on very large matrices and vectors, it will likely be a, a pretty good fit for processing in memory, but if the size of the matrix and the vector <clears throat> is relatively small and they fit in the L3 of uh, your CPU, probably you don't want to go to the memory to, for the execution because uh, you can um, use the cache effi efficiently. So the scheduling decisions are also uh, important or the example of uh, PIM enabled instructions. We could offload the execution of a PIM enabled instruction to the PIM side if the data is not in the cache hierarchy. We can have a locality monitor that checks where uh, data resides and compute where it makes sense. And finally, infrastructures to assess benefits and feasibility. Uh, why is that important? Because, uh, I mean, it's, it's always important in, in, in research, in particular in, in research in computer systems and computer architecture. You cannot always uh, evaluate the real system. Uh, if you are designing a new processor, uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, fabricate the first design that you come up with, right? Because most likely it won't perform uh, great and you will have to fix many things. That's why we need other types of infrastructures like performance models or simulators or other type, uh, types of, um, uh, of models that can uh, allow us to evaluate uh, how good or bad the system that we are designing is going to be. And not only the, uh, the simulators or the uh, uh, performance models themselves, but also the workloads that we use for uh, those architectures, evaluating architectures or designing new architectures. So all these different issues span the entire transformation hierarchy that you're already familiar with. And um, you can find many details about these different uh, things that we are going to discuss in, in, in this lecture in the uh, PIM book chapter, in particular in section eight. You can see uh, programming models, PIM runtime, memory coherence, virtual memory support, data structures, benchmarks and simulation infrastructures, etc. cetera. Uh, there are shorter versions of uh, this PIM book chapter in the form of uh, uh, journal papers. This is uh, one that we published in 2019, and this is another one. Okay, so let's uh, start talking about these different topics, that uh, these different challenges or issues that we need to overcome in order to enable uh, PIM in the real world. Well, the first thing, and we have already talked about that yesterday uh, in the lecture and today in the beginning of the lecture, we want to have access to real PIM systems uh, either commercially available like AppMem or prototypes like Samsung or SK Hynix uh, um, um, approaches or proposals that are not yet um, commercially available as far as I know. And, uh, and, and that's why we are uh, very much interested in all these kind of systems. We need to understand real systems in order to propose improvements for future architectures and figure out what are the workloads that can benefit from these PIM, uh, PIM real, uh, real PIM systems. Uh, we have already talked uh, about this. I'm not uh, going to, again, elaborate on each of the um, uh, different architectures that have been announced so far. Uh, you can uh, learn uh, many more details by watching the lectures of our PIM course. Remember that so far we have talked about the admin PIM architecture, also Samsung HVM PIM or uh, FinDRAM. ram uh, You already uh, saw this slide yesterday. This has a link to a longer lecture. lecture. This is the um, SK Hynix AIM, same as Samsung HVM PIM is uh, uh, for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, Samsung AXDIM is um, uh, more, well, like, um, more configurable in the sense that you have an FPGA that you can program, for example, for recommendation models, but there are also other works for databases, for example, has also been uh, tested. You can uh, also learn a little bit more about this one or this last one from Alibaba for recommendation systems, okay? But these are not the only real world prototypes or real world systems that we could use. Uh, there, are, there are even more. And actually, if you search, you Google for uh, different companies uh, in, uh, exploring or fabricating um, uh, processing in memory systems, you will see that there are, uh, there are a few more. Um, 
uh, most of them um, do what we call processing near memory. Most of them, in a similar way of just seeing in AppMem, Samsung, SK Hynix, most of them place some sort of processing element or compute unit near the memory. So that's why we call them processing um, near memory systems or near memory architectures. But uh, we believe that there will be processing using memory architectures as well in the near future. And there have been uh, some uh, interesting uh, advances, some interesting progress in academic research about processing using memory in real chips. This is a paper from 2019 where the authors were able to perform uh, processing using memory or processing using DRAM operations on real chips. We are not going to um, go into the details today because the processing in memory, uh, sorry, processing using memory will be covered uh, next Thursday by um, Geraldo. But I wanted to show you this, probably Geraldo will also talk about this uh, compute DRAM work and how the authors use the soft uh, SoftNC infrastructure uh, to perform some computation using DRAM cells. Actually, the computation that they were able to test was row copy, how to copy an entire row uh, from one place to another place inside the same DRAM subarray, or how to perform AND and OR operations. And based on this work, Compute DRAM, in our group, we developed an end-to-end implementation of, uh, of uh, such uh, uh, um, a system um, that can be useful for further studies, right? Uh, we can consider this a real prototype. This was indeed implemented on an FPEA with a custom memory controller, as well as a single core RISC-V CPU in the FPEA to access the DRAM DIM let's call it compute enable DIM because it was possible to activate multiple rows in order to perform some sort of computation. I think uh, Geraldo will probably go into more details. This doesn't pretend to be uh, say commercial product because it's uh, with just a single core RISC-V you cannot uh, run much, but pretends more to be a, a research infrastructure, a research platform to enable the adoption of processing in memory because we can study with this platform how to deal with memory coherence, with uh, virtual memory address translation, et cetera, or with memory allocation, et cetera. Okay, yeah, feel free to ask any questions whenever needed. Okay, more things that uh, we need to worry about if we want to enable processing in memory in the real world. Uh, programming models and code generation. You are already learning how to program this admin pin system. We have uh, described what are challenges to add the, the, the implement code for this uh, pin system. We have talked uh, talk about the um, uh, inter-DPU communication or about the transposition library. Uh, this is a link to a longer version of the lecture that, well, it's more or less, uh, maybe a little bit longer than, than what I covered earlier, but yeah. Um, probably with a few more details. This one is from, from last year, um, if you want to, uh, to take a look. So yeah, uh, we are already studying how to program real pin systems, but these are not the only pin systems that we are uh, interested in, that we worry about in this course. Uh, processing using memory systems are also, uh, also need a way of uh, being programmed. And uh, Geraldo will talk about this SIMDRAM framework that allows us to uh, create um, uh, new uh, operations for a processing using DRAM uh, uh, architecture. And yeah, you can see uh, some uh, example code that would be the high level code, the C code that we compile into something like this. Each of these BB ops that you see here are processing using DRAM operations, either an addition, a subtraction, uh, greater than, or an if else, all of that can be run using DRAM um, as uh, Geraldo will, will explain. But in the meantime, you can watch this lecture if you, if you want. Okay, more things, uh, runtime, uh, runtime decisions, right? Uh, scheduling and data mapping. Already yesterday, we talked about the execution of simple ping operations uh, near the memory, right? The, uh, 
PIM enabled instructions. Um, what was the motivation to do so? Motivation was uh, reducing the data movement in certain algorithms, for example, in graph processing algorithms like PageRank, uh, instead of bringing one entire cache line to the uh, main, um, I mean, to the host processor, performing the computation there, and then writing back the uh, cache line, it might be enough to just offload the execution of one a specific operation, this PIM add, for example, uh, from the um, CPU to the main memory. This would just require us to move eight bytes back from the um, host processor to the main memory. However, and we uh, saw some uh, results yesterday, it's not always a good idea to always offload the computation to the memory side. Why is that? because what really makes sense is to compute where the data resides. And if the program running on the CPU has, for whatever reason, already accessed certain cache lines, and those cache lines are already here in the cache hierarchy, it doesn't make sense to offload the computation to these units there, right? So um, that's why in the PEI work proposed this locality monitor that checks the contents of the uh, last level cache. And every time that uh, the uh, CPU wants to execute one PEI instruction, one PIM enable instruction on certain data, on certain cache line, uh, the locality monitor will check if the, that cache line is already here in the cache hierarchy or not. And based on that, decide if computation of, is offloaded to the main memory or executed near the host, okay? So that's an example of uh, a scheduling decision. And these are some results that we already uh, showed yesterday for large inputs. Not always PIM is uh, beneficial or not as much beneficial as, is, as it could be. The locality aware execution can achieve uh, uh, a little bit higher speed up in most cases and also additional energy savings as well in, in, in most cases, especially for a small or medium data sets that more likely fit uh, onto the cache hierarchy. Um, yeah, makes sense to not always offload to the PIM and sometimes uh, run um, uh, in, the, in the host itself. Okay, yeah, you can uh, take a closer look at the, uh, at the code, I mean, at the code, at the paper um, that this um, is available there. Okay, another work where uh, it was uh, necessary to um, study, I mean, to um, make decisions in terms of where to map code and also where to map data was the uh, Tom paper, Trumpa transparent uh, of loading uh, paper for uh, GPUs, right? Um, um, well, um, th 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 there is a main GPU, there are also uh, stacks of three stack memory and in the logic layer of them, there are um, some small SMs or GPU cores that have uh, uh, faster access to the, to the memory and for certain operations that are um, uh, identified uh, by, the, uh, by the runtime system uh, on the fly, um, it's possible to make use of these uh, GPU cores in the logic layer. However, the GPU cores need to have access to the code itself, right? So the code that they need to execute, the piece of the kernel, the GPU kernel that they need to execute, it's uh, preferred to be in the same vault or at least in the same um, 3D stack memory and the same for the data mapping. Uh, the data mapping that this kind of system uh, good need or good require for um, um, better performance for the, its highest performance uh, could be different from the data mapping that um, existing GPUs are using. Uh, when exist, uh, real GPUs already have access to several stacks, if you check, uh, for example, the um, NVIDIA A100 or H100 GPU, you'll see that they have uh, access to five or six HVM2 uh, or HVM3 uh, stacks. And the way that the data is mapped uh, is um, such that you can exploit the parallelism um, from accessing multiple stacks at the same time, right? <clears throat> However, uh, if you want to have processing elements in the logic layer that can directly compute here, these 
uh, cores, these processing elements should hopefully access always or most of the times data that resides in the same stack because otherwise they will have to go through these links and the latency will be much longer and that will make the performance worse. So data mapping is also, or code and data mapping are also uh, important considerations when designing a processing in memory system or how to schedule the code as well. These also, these are also work for GPUs, scheduling techniques also has ways of deciding when a kernel is suitable for PIM or not so suitable for PIM based on compiler and runtime uh, techniques. And this is another example of that. And this is a, another one, but there are still research questions to answer and these can inspire uh, future research for sure. Uh, for example, what are simple mechanisms to enable and disable PIM execution or how can PIM execution be throttled for highest performance gains? Not always good to use PIM, that's uh, for sure. Or how should data locations and access patterns affect where or whether PIM executions should occur? Uh, more research questions, which parts of a given application's code should be executed on PIM? How do we identify, what are the mechanisms to identify those parts of the application that can benefit from PIM? Or what are scheduling mechanisms that can share PIM engines between multiple or PIM uh, accelerators or PIM cores between multiple requesting cores to maximize the benefits uh, obtained from PIM? That's something that uh, I didn't mention before. Uh, but but I think it was already explicit in the explanation, uh, implicit in the explanation. Uh, when when we talk about the admin pin system, first thing that uh, we discuss when 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 uh, explaining how to program it is that we need to allocate the DPU set, right? And one thing I told you is you have so many uh, DPUs in the system, more than two thousand DPUs in the system that you may not need, or your application may not need to use all of them. So that's why you allocate a DPU set. For example, 512 DPUs, right? So the remaining DPUs are going to be available to other processes, right? Observe that what I'm saying here is that we are doing sort of a spatial partitioning of the DPUs and we are assigning different DPUs to different processes, right? That for sure makes sense in that admin system because the DPUs themselves are pretty uh, wimpy, right? They are not very fast. They cannot run many threads. Uh, they have also limited memory capacity, just 64 megabytes. So it doesn't really make sense to have more than one application using each DPU. But in other processing in memory systems, you may have much larger amount of memory available to each PIM core or accessible to each PIM core. And, um, and there, there might be uh, processing in memory architectures where we want or may need to uh, schedule computation from different applications, from different processes onto the same cores. How are we going to share that capability, those compute capabilities? Well, we need to figure, figure out the scheduling mechanisms that ensure, for example, isolation in the execution of different processes and make sure that one process cannot access the data of a different process, uh, for, for example, right? Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, another question, what are simple mechanisms to manage access to a memory that serves both CPU requests and PIM requests? So if you have CPU and PIM cores both accessing the same memory space at the same time, how do you arbitrate those accesses, right? That's for sure not a problem in the current admin pin system, right? It's not a problem because when the CPU accesses, the DPUs cannot access and vice versa, but something we uh, mentioned as well, ideally both could access at the same time because this way they can collaborate and have more fine grained collaboration, or we could simply write data from the CPU while the DPU is performing computation as well. So uh, in a future PIN system, that those are uh, answers that uh, we will have to look for. Okay, questions? Yeah, another uh, important uh, consideration for end-to-end -end system integration is uh, memory coherence, right? And, and, and indeed, we already saw this um, uh, graph yesterday um, showing, well, this is um, um, the performance uh, or speed up over some baseline that is CPU only 
for several workloads with different data sets and considering uh, different uh, coherence mechanisms. Memory coherence mechanisms between the main, uh, between the CPU and the pin cores, okay? Because exactly what uh, I was saying earlier, we may have future pin systems where the CPU and the pin cores can access the same data at the same time. Maybe because we want a fine grain collaboration or we want to accelerate the performance even more for whatever reason, right? But if that's the case, you know that every time that the CPU accesses some address from memory, an entire cache line comes to the cache hierarchy. And when the CPU performs modifications to that cache line, the modifications are, are done in the cache. And sometime later, that cache, that cache line will get evicted to the main memory and the data in main memory will be in its most, most recent or updated form or value, right? Um, now, what happens if you have PIM cores operating on the same data structure at the same time? The PIM cores could potentially access the same cache lines that are already in the cache hierarchy of the CPU. And that could create problems with data coherence, right? Uh, the PIM cores would be using a stale data, right? Which is the, the, the cache line in the, in the main memory, or in the, yeah, in the, in the PIM memory, right? So that's why we need to uh, articulate, we need to create coherence mechanisms, same as there are coherence mechanisms or coherence protocols in multi-core CPUs so that caches and data are kept coherent. Uh, we need to have them, that insistence with processing in memory capabilities. And that's what um, uh, the lazy pin work and later the conduct work uh, proposed and, and compared to other ways of doing uh, coherence in a more traditional manner. And well, um, let me uh, show you very uh, quickly what this is about. Conda is the most recent publication from 2019. Uh, in Conda, um, the, the, the assumption is a processing in memory system or a memory centric computing system with a CPU and with a 3D stack DRAM with some accelerators or PIM cores in the logic layer and exactly the uh, situation that I was uh, describing. We have CPUs and, uh, and PIM cores accessing the same data structures at the same time. Um, so we need to enable coherence, we need to create coherence mechanisms. The problem with the traditional coherence mechanisms, if we apply, for example, the MESI protocol is one of the mechanisms that was evaluated, or protocols that was evaluated here. If you use a MESI protocol between main memory, so between the host processor and the PIM cores, uh, the, a significant portion of the potential benefits is going to uh, get uh, uh, eliminated, right? And um, uh, those coherence protocols are not suitable for these kind of pin systems because they entail unnecessary uh, data movement. So um, the Conda work proposes a mechanism that is optimistic in the sense that assumes that um, coherence checks are not needed and just need to happen uh, at some point. It uh, optimistically assumes that CPU and NDA accelerators or PIM accelerators or PIM cores are not going to access the same data at the same time. And then it runs the execution, assuming optimistically that everything is going to work well. Um, as you see in this part of the um, execution, we have concurrent CPU and NDA or PIM execution and there are no coherence requests in between. At the end of this section with concurrent execution, some signatures are represented. These signatures uh, somehow enclose information about the cache lines that have been updated both in the CPU and on the PIM side. And they exchange the signatures to compare what cache lines were accessed here and there. And if everything went well, we are done. If uh, there was some conflict that is in this signature and this signature, the same cache lines are represented, then we would need to have a coherence resolution. And the coherence resolution basically mean committing that is finishing 
we are done, everything went well, or re-execute. Okay, so that would require that we execute again the uh, code on the pin side already using the updated cache lines from the uh, CP. So that's the basic idea, as you see. It's kind of similar to uh, transactional memory, if you have heard of transactional memory. And um, well, in the end, it performed pretty well for the applications that they were, uh, were evaluated. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, remark that this is coherence, coherent mechanism between the host CPU and the pin cores, the memory side, right? For coherence between the pin cores themselves, we could potentially use other coherence mechanisms, assuming that they have access to the same data. That's not necessary in a real system like AppMem, because in a real system like AppMem, each pin core has access to only its own memory exclusively in an exclusive manner. So there are no problems with coherence, right? And um, yeah, every uh, and communication and everything needs to be handled by the program. Okay, so this is the uh, link to the paper. And we may need to uh, communicate the pin cores for sure. As I said, as you know already in the, PIN, in the admin pin system, no because that uh, direct communication doesn't exist. You need to uh, handle communication through the uh, host CPU, but there are other pin systems where there might be ways of communicating different pin cores. And that's what the Synchron work proposed in 2021. In this case, uh, we are assuming a pin system uh, that is composed by uh, multiple pin units and inside each of the pin units we have multiple pin cores. You can think about the Tesseract accelerator. In Tesseract, we have multiple cubes and multiple HMC cubes. And in the logic layer of each HMC cube, we have several uh, accelerators or several pin cores. So it's such kind of a scenario where you really need to communicate different threads running in different uh, pin cores, right? And that's uh, useful in many applications, for example, in graph analytics, like single source, skirt test path, uh, if we have uh, two threads uh, or many more or, or many more threads, right? Uh, calculating the uh, shortest path for a, a specific graph, we may have um, threads, different threads uh, concurrently accessing the same vertices and potentially updating the same distances of the, or the same shortest paths. Uh, if there are uh, those updates, we want them to happen atomically so that we obtain uh, correct results if that's the case. That's why uh, in, in this kind of uh, computation, we typically use or either atomic operations or some sort of locks or mutexes. Remember the mutex lock and unlock that we have in the in the AppMem DPUs. So this would be a kind of similar thing. This is a critical section that can only be accessed by one thread or one core at a time. But this is not only, I mean, it's not only for graph analytics, but also other applications require synchronization. Uh, this is the baseline NDP architecture, near data processing or processing in memory architecture that we consider in this, uh, uh, in this work. Uh, observe that is, uh, as I said, the, the topology is kind of similar to the Tesseract accelerator that we presented yesterday. This is the NDP system composed of multiple NDP units and inside each of them, we have uh, more than one NDP core. These NDP cores are, typically quite weak, a small processors, maybe a programmable core or an accelerator with a small cache or a small scratch pad or something like that. Uh, there are uh, some challenges to uh, implement synchronization mechanisms in this kind of NDP system. Why? Because first of all, there is a lack of hardware cache coherent support. Probably there is a lack of hardware uh, cache coherent support, right? Think about the admin team system. You have very limited uh, amount of logic that you can place near the memory arrays, right? So you really need to make intelligent decisions about what you want to have there. And probably you will likely uh, prioritize having more ALUs, which are the units that really compute rather than supporting cache coherence, for example. It's, um, there is expensive communication across NDP units. Uh, of course, if you need to send data from here to here, latency is going to be longer. So in principle, you prefer to avoid 
uh, that uh, communication. And also there is a lack of a shared level of cache memory. So in a multi-core CPU, for example, where you have several cores, let's say eight or 16, but all of them has ac have access to the same last level cache, uh, that's, uh, you know, it's like a, um, a common memory space where all threads can access and we can use for synchronization of different threads running in different cores, right? But here, PIM system is more like a distributed system. There is no shared level of cache, right? So techniques that have traditionally worked well for other types of compute systems like CPUs or GPUs might not be good for PIN system. That's why uh, it's necessary to come up with something new. It's a synchron, it's a message passing approach that uses uh, specialized hardware to make it even more efficient than software-based uh, schemes, okay? So what uh, Synchron proposes is in that in each NDP unit, which could be like one uh, 3D stack or cube of 3D stack memory, uh, in each NDP unit, we have one synchronization engine that is in charge of gathering synchronization requests or receiving synchronization requests from the different NDP cores or from the threads running in, in, in those NDP cores. And in the synchronization processing unit or synchronization engine, we have some uh, processing unit to uh, take care of the um, um, synchronization request and a table for the requests that are coming from the different cores and some counters to do uh, indexing. For example, when one log acquire request arrives at the uh, processing unit, this um, uh, request is uh, entered uh, into the uh, synchronization table. And at some point, the <clears throat> synchronization engine is going to send the request from the different cores to one central synchronization engine that is considered the master. That's why this is a hierarchical communication, right? This NDP core and this NDP core send the request to this synchronization engine. And at some point, this synchronization engine will share them with the main or master synchronization engine that resides in one of the uh, NDP units, right? So here you see how the global log acquire is sent to the synchronization, the, the, the master synchronization engine and this way we minimize the traffic because we are doing hierarchical communication, right? Because each of the local synchronization engines is, uh, is um, uh, gathering uh, the, uh, the requests from uh, different NDP cores in the same NDP units and sending, sending them all together, okay? So uh, benefits, high system performance, low hardware costs, programming ease, general synchronization support, and uh, pretty good results as well compared to an ideal system with zero uh, synchronization overhead. This is uh, Synchron. Maybe one uh, recommended reading of this course, but uh, for sure you can learn more by watching uh, the uh, this uh, lecture uh, delivered by uh, Cristina Gianola, who uh, is the first author of uh, the Synchron paper. Okay, synchronization is also important when accessing concurrent data structures. This is also another interesting work uh, dealing with uh, skip list and link list, uh, all in the context of processing in memory. One more, uh, virtual memory support, right? Uh, we have, Processing uh, in memory is super uncomfortable. Yeah, we have uh, processing uh, in memory cores and these processing in memory cores might need to do memory address translation. Do I am saying might need because it's not always the case. The admin DPUs, the admin PIM cores, they directly operate on physical addresses, right? So no virtual memory support is needed. But that's uh, doable, that's possible in the, in the uh, PIM cores of the admin system because each PIM core is only used by a single process, by a single application, right? So we don't need to use virtual memory. Uh, the, the, the threads running on that core can access the entire DRAM bank, uh, which is not that big, but that's enough for them. And, um, and that's why they don't need to do uh, virtual memory support. But uh, if we have a, potentially a, a more powerful PIM core that can be shared across uh, multiple processes, 
we want each of the processes to access only their own part of the virtual memory, right? And that would require that the <coughs> PIM cores <coughs> have um, some um, virtual memory support and some way of doing virtual memory address translation. And there might be different approaches to solve this. In the end, the best approach is always the approach that better fits the specific architecture, right? Uh, if you think about AppMem, it doesn't need virtual memory support at all. If you think about uh, PIM enabled instructions, uh, we, uh, uh, we already talked about that yesterday because they are only addressing a single cache line the uh, virtual memory address translation can be done on the host CPU and then just the physical address is sent to the near memory processing units or processing in memory units. Depending on the different uh, team architecture, we might need a different solution as well. And what I want to show you here is uh, the solution, uh, quite, uh, um, 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 quite uh, interesting and good solution that was proposed in these uh, accelerating pointer chasing in 3D stack memory in this paper uh, that is called Impica for short, because Impica is the name of the accelerator that is proposed in this work, an accelerator for pointer chasing applications. And um, one, uh, th that's uh, the, the, the name, in memory pointer chasing application or Impica for short. Uh, so one of important or interesting observation in this, um, um, work is that uh, there is, uh, I mean, processing in memory can be very useful, but there is a cost of doing the memory address translation and um, figuring out what are the addresses that need to be accessed. So in order to uh, do this more efficiently, uh, the authors propose to decouple the address calculation and the memory access in the PIN course, and you're going to see how. They also propose this uh, in PICA page table that is a sort of a simplified or low cost page table uh, that is going to reside in the logic layer of the, of the uh, 3D stack memory, right? And is, um, um, is a, um, different from the page table that the CPU uh, processor uses. Um, <clears throat> Linked data uh, structures are widely used in many important applications, for example, databases, B3, key value stores, hash table, et cetera. So these are linked data structures connected by pointers. So um, solving one of these problems requires traversing linked data structures, chasing the pointers. So if you have a tree, something like this, and you need to find, uh, or you need to reach to a specific uh, leave of the of the tree, you'll have to go one by one over the nodes in this tree, right? And that in a um, conventional processor centric system uh, would require you to first access the root of the tree uh, with some address and get some data that contains the pointer of the successors, the children of this uh, uh, the root node. And then for example, access the next one in this case, uh, node E and bring the data back and then uh, find where A is and then bring the information that uh, we want to gather from A, bring it to the CP, right? This is a serialized and irregular access pattern is pretty costly uh, to, to do the computation this way because it might need uh, multiple cycles for each instruction that we want to execute. So we want to go to this node and that requires us to go several times back and forth between memory and the processor. And that's obviously not uh, good. So the goal and the idea in this work is to accelerate pointer chasing um, applications inside the main memory. And to do so, uh, they design an accelerator called Impica in the logic layer of uh, 3D stack memory. So that if we want to find one specific node of a tree, for example, we just need to send that request to the logic layer and this uh, pointer chasing operation will happen in the uh, accelerator in the logic layer and the data will be retrieved to the CPU at the end, okay? But the idea looks good, but is not so straightforward to implement in an efficient manner. Why is that? Well, if you think about uh, regular CPU core, performing this operation, we could do, or, or any uh, operation in general, we have some computation at some point, we have one L2 or L3 needs, 
and needs to go to the memory. And then when we get the cache line that we were waiting for, we continue the um, computation, right? Uh, if you think about the memory and in memory accelerator, in the memory accelerator, we can expect the memory access to be faster, right? Because we are closer to the memory. We're closer to the memory. So the latency of a memory access is expected to be shorter. So this would be, give us some room for improvement, right? Making use of um, PIM accelerators can be good because memory accesses can be faster. Um, so we can save time. However, uh, CPU cores are not that stupid, and we usually have more than one CPU core, more than one thread running on the CPU, on each CPU core, and requesting data from memory. And they can exploit uh, memory level parallelism in different ways. There are multiple channels, there are multiple banks, and they can be accessed at the same time. This way, exploiting the parallelism, sustaining more memory accesses at a time, and this way, uh, um, uh, obtaining a higher um, um, uh, sustained memory bandwidth. While in the memory accelerator, where maybe we don't have uh, several cores, we would need to serialize those accesses, so it would be slower, right? So what's the um, idea that the uh, Impica accelerator proposes? Is that instead of having a single accelerator just doing everything, we could have uh, a decouple accelerator where the uh, address calculation and the memory access is done independently. So the address engine computes some address that needs to be accessed, and this memory access is performed by a different part of the accelerator. It's like having two accelerators working together, right? So for the next request, Again, we need to compute some address and we can start the memory access earlier and so on and so forth, right? So this would be the idea. And this way is really possible to uh, enable, I mean, enable more parallelism on the pin side and, uh, and, and outperforming the execution on the host CPU, okay? Challenge is that the address engine need to perform virtual memory address translation, right? Well, this is a, a, a simplified representation of how this works. We have the address engine, we have the access engine. The access engine is the one that accesses the different layers through the local memory controller. This address engine is receiving requests, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then there is some uh, in, some cache as well that can be, so um, it can be used by both engines. So we receive the request from the CPU, um, there is a request queue, the address engine obtains addresses and, um, and sends requests to the access engine, as you can see, and uh, those requests can be served in parallel through the memory controller, and when we get the results back, they go to the corresponding response queue, then to the address engine, and then from there, they can be sent to the CPU or anything else. Challenge here is, as I uh, was saying, is performing the address translation. You cannot use the memory uh, management unit. Uh, you cannot do memory um, address translation on the host because it's too far. We need to figure out ways of doing the memory address translation. If we uh, had to do the memory address translation on the host CPU, we probably need to repeat these uh, page table works uh, uh, again and again and again, and that's not uh, really efficient. It's not efficient for CPUs, so it would be even worse if we need to do this for the PIM cores themselves. But the problem is there is no TLB or memory management unit on the memory side, and duplicating everything is going to be costly. Um, the page table work requires multiple memory accesses, so that's not um, ideal, it's not a good idea. So um, we also decouple the page table of Impica from the page table of the uh, CPU. And if the CPU uh, has a page table that connects the virtual address space to the physical address space, so that if a virtual page is here, the physical page is there, and the CPU page table tells us exactly where in the physical memory the pages reside, <clears throat> we're going to designate <clears throat> one region of the virtual address space that is, called, is gonna be called the Impica region. That's the region of the entire virtual memory that is going to be used by the 
in Pika Accelerator. So uh, we, uh, in, the, in the virtual address space, we place the virtual pages that are going to be used by the Impic Accelerator in this uh, Impica region, and they are going to be mapped in a certain part of the physical memory. So that's what uh, Impica proposes. The Impica page table is divided into, uh, into three parts in, 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 in the end. Uh, this region table, the flat page table, and the a small page table and using uh, bits of the virtual address, we can obtain the uh, physical address, okay? Uh, advantages of this approach. First of all, the region table is uh, very, very small. So it will be always in the cache and probably for the uh, a small page table, it's, it's also pretty small just for kilobytes. So it might also be, it might also fit in the cache while the uh, flat page table is just, uh, well, it's, it's relatively small. So it can fit in the local memory of the uh, processing in memory accelerator and save memory accesses in the end. Results were good. These are, uh, this is a comparison of an out of order multi core CPU and the Impica accelerator uh, for a specific uh, configuration, right? Um, you can have, a, you can access the simulator what that was used for this study. And here you see some results for micro benchmark with linked list, hash tables, and B3 uh, for the baseline CPU and for the Impica accelerator. Um, some interesting speed ups. There are also uh, results for database performance is speed up or the throughput improvement is not great, but well, uh, is up to 16% uh, faster and also shorter latency in the database queries. And in terms of performance, uh, there are also some uh, good energy savings in some cases. Okay. So this is one potential solution to virtual memory address translation in processing in memory systems. It's a, a kind of a interesting approach performed by uh, this uh, Impica paper, but there could be more. Uh, another recommended reading is um, this virtual block interface that is not um, explicitly uh, devised for processing in memory systems, but could be uh, useful as well in processing in memory systems uh, by uh, providing the um, memory controller with the capability of performing memory address translation directly instead of uh, doing everything in the operating system as is usually done in conventional, in, in conventional uh, virtual memory systems. BBI has shown uh, good performance for cloud environment or yeah, very promising performance for cloud environments, for heterogeneous memory systems, and it's for sure uh, an interesting research proposal that uh, can also be very um, suitable for uh, PIM systems. And well, you can learn more uh, from uh, about this virtual block interface because it was one of the uh, research lectures that we had in three years ago in fall 2020. That's uh, Nastaran, who is the first author, a former uh, PhD student of our group. Okay, processing in memory can be useful for many more things. For example, there are security considerations that need to be taken into account for sure. We were talking a um, um, few slides ago, we were talking about the possibility of multiple processes accessing the same pin cores. You need to uh, definitely create isolation mechanisms to avoid uh, side channels, etc that uh, could cause uh, serious risks in compute systems, but processing in memory can also be useful exactly to protect uh, compute systems. For example, uh, these days um, random numbers are uh, very um, useful in many um, uh, security related applications or physically unclonable functions as well. You might have heard of them are also um, 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 useful for you know uh, security purposes uh, to create signatures that can identify different devices in a system, and this way other devices can at least, uh, for example, um, uh, double check that they can trust the other part or uh, the other device, right? So these kind of things um, uh, are um, used in the security mechanisms these days. And, uh, and, and, and some of uh, prior work of our group has shown that it's possible to create uh, these uh, physically unclonable functions by uh, operating directly with uh, or, or, or change, well, kind of 
uh, tricking the way that DRAM operates. <clears throat> DRAM is possible to operate uh, at, at the reduced latency. You may remember from the first day that we talk about Eden as an example of approximate memory that reduces the latencies, the, lat the, the intervals for the accesses to the DRAM cells. Uh, by playing with those latencies, it's also possible to um, um, you know, uh, generate uh, physically unclinable functions depending on what's the uh, chance of uh, failure that different cells, different cells might have at reduced latencies. That's something that was proposed in this different latency path. Also similar idea was later explored to uh, generate random numbers um, also using DRAM by playing with the uh, latencies and the probability of failure. So similar um, key idea useful for uh, something different that is the generation of random numbers or more recently um, the, there is this other work that activates uh, multiple rows at the same time, in particular four rows at the same time, in order to uh, generate random numbers. I think, I mean, these are mostly processing using memory proposals. That's why I'm going quickly over them because uh, they will be introduced in the processing using memory lecture. But um, I wanted to have uh, the slides here as well in this presentation because uh, part of the challenges related to enabling processing memory in real systems are uh, connected to uh, security. So whatever uh, means um, um, improving the security mechanisms in the system and if processing in memory can enable those, the, that's um, uh, for sure really good. Well, the basic idea in Quark TRNG is that you activate four rows at the same time inside the DRAM subarray. And because you are activating four rows, if there are, for example, two zeros and two ones, you don't know what's going to be the final result in the sense amplifier, right? So depending on the uh, characteristics of the different cells and the process variation of different cells, the result will end up going to zero or one. So that can be a way of generating random numbers. That's the basic idea in uh, Quark TRNG. Okay, we are approaching the end. Um, something that Dion also mentioned uh, in the beginning of the presentation, of this presentation, is that we also need infrastructures to evaluate how good or bad potential or possible pin, pin systems are, right? So that requires us to develop benchmarks as workloads that we will use to study uh, real or simulated processing in memory systems and also. Uh, the infrastructures themselves to evaluate those systems, like for example, simulators or some sort of performance models, right? And that's uh, why, well, a lot of work is done in this direction from our group, but also from many other people, like for example, Prim Benchmarks uh, is a, a benchmark suite for the admin PIM architecture with different workloads, uh, like uh, dense and sparse linear algebra, databases, data analytics, et cetera. Um, it's uh, all publicly available and is uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the basis uh, of the analysis that uh, we have done and, and many of the um, insights that uh, I, find I have explained in the previous lecture. Um, we have developed as well uh, methodologies to identify when a workload can be more or less suitable for processing in memory or understand as well what are the characteristics of their um, memory bottlenecks, if there are memory bottlenecks, likely there will be. Uh, this is called the DAMOVE methodology, it consists of application profiling and then some additional analysis, scalability analysis, uh, with a simulator that we created for this methodology and based on the metrics that we obtain from the profiling, for the analysis with the simulator, we can perform a classification of the different memory bottlenecks and this way identify different memory bottlenecks that can affect many different workloads. In this um, work, uh, we uh, analyzed more than 100 workloads and found six different classes, main classes of memory bottlenecks, some of which could be addressed with processing in memory capabilities. It's a uh, part of Geraldo's PhD thesis, and you can watch a longer lecture uh, from our PIM course. This has also the uh, content of uh, 
past uh, courses uh, of, of past editions of this processing in memory course. The move comes with one simulator that is called the move sim. There are other simulators that you can use for processing in memory studies. For example, a Ramulator. You will use Ramulator in one of the labs. And if you get familiar with it, you can also use it for uh, processing in memory. Indeed, there is a version of Ramulator that is called Ramulator PIM. But there are other uh, simulators that can be used. For example, MQSIM is a simulator for SSDs. Uh, in SSDs, we can also do processing in memory or near data processing, we will typically call it uh, processing in storage, right? But simulation is not always great. Simulation takes time. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's probably kind of accurate, right? Because simulators are usually well validated, but simulation takes time. And if you want to do, let's say a very wide design space exploration and try many different configurations of uh, the of a potential or possible PIM architecture, uh, running so many simulations might take too much time. So if you have something simpler, like a performance model, maybe you are good to go. And then after you have identified what are the best designs, you further simulate those best designs. And that was the um, main motivation for this NAPL near memory computing application performance prediction via ensemble learning that uses exactly ensemble learning to um, 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 yeah to to predict what's the what's the performance and en the energy consumption of applications on processing in memory. Okay, so one uh, thing that was uh, first shown in this um, work is that simulation is much more slow than uh, uh, execution on a real system. And that's why uh, uh, we propose uh, ML with the statistical techniques uh, for quick performance and energy prediction in processing in memory systems. Uh, the uh, key idea is to first train a model, ensemble learning uh, model that makes use of uh, um, application features and also hardware features coming either from uh, um, a compiler-based, LLVM-based analysis, and also um, uh, information about the um, um, architecture itself, even if it's uh, simulated, uh, we can use these, uh, these uh, ensemble learning algorithm. And based on that information about the application and the potential PIN system, the uh, ensemble learning algorithm is trained, and then it can be used for prediction um, just with uh, information from the new application. So even for, for an application that has not been um, uh, implemented for a specific PIN system, we could obtain uh, information from its baseline code, like the instruction mix or the type of memory accesses it has, or the memory access patterns or the uh, instruction level parallelism that the application may have. And based on that, use the NAPL model for the performance prediction. And actually, now you can see how accurate the performance prediction is um, compared to, well, NAPL is the uh, leftmost, uh, rightmost one. Uh, there are also comparison to other uh, ML-based prediction methods like decision tree and an artificial neural network. And in the end, uh, well, um, NAPL can be much faster than doing the same analysis on a PIN simulator. So that's the uh, basically the, the idea of uh, this NAPL work. Okay, so I guess uh, we are good to go. The last part of the uh, presentation is just about different examples of applications that uh, have been shown suitable for uh, processing in memory systems, but we have already mentioned some of these works uh, in the past and uh, in, in prior lectures. Uh, remember that um, you can uh, check and, and most of the contents of the uh, three lectures that I've given about processing in memory are in this book chapter. So definitely a good reference for you. Uh, remember that we are developing and these, or we are studying these kind of architectures, processing in memory in order to make uh, computing systems more data centric and 
hopefully more energy efficient and high performance computer architectures with minimal data movement. Uh, you can keep learning about PIM. You will keep learning next Thursday uh, with Geraldo, but you can keep learning with our PIM course and also with uh, talks and lectures from uh, Professor Mudlu, like for example, these ones. There is also a longer version of this uh, enabling PIM lecture that uh, is from the, uh, from the PIM course. Um, the contents are more or less the same, but maybe uh, with uh, a few more details uh, because uh, it takes longer probably than what we uh, took now. And, um, and yeah, and you can keep uh, learning even more from our past tutorials. And remember as well that we will have uh, a next tutorial on October 29th is fully virtual. So you are all welcome to join and, um, and hopefully uh, keep interested in processing in memory. Okay, that's all from my side. Let me know if you have any questions. We are over time, but I think that uh, it was okay. We were able to cover most of it with a certain detail. Any questions? No? Okay, so then uh, have a good weekend and uh, see you next week. <laughs>